All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to ADCX. I am so psyched to kick things off and uh, I get to be the first. So uh, super excited. I'm here today to talk to you about smart algorithms. Uh, and we're going to hear a bunch of talks today um, that are going to focus on various machine learning uh, techniques and uh, detailed presentations on specific topics. And I want to give more of a general overview. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define smart algorithms as algorithms that resolve ambiguities. Customers increasingly expect our products and applications to magically just work and infer what the user wants to do and what they intend to do. And when we resolve ambiguities for them and do something sensible in the face of ambiguities, that's when our applications and products feel smart. And so while it would be pretty silly to uh, assert that, for example, a wake word detection algorithm or a tempo estimation algorithm possesses some sort of intelligence, um, when these kinds of algorithms, algorithms resolve ambiguities, our applications feel smart, and that's what we care about, and that's why I'm calling them smart in quotes today. So machine learning has given us a wonderful set of tools for creating new smart algorithms that we never were able to create before. Often though, I also see developers turning to models that are large and hard to deploy uh, when that's not necessarily the best solution. So in this talk, I hope to give you some basic principles and guidelines for figuring out how to approach a smart algorithm design and also where it makes sense to leverage machine learning techniques and where it makes sense to leverage more traditional DSP. So I'm going to start by talking about domain knowledge because the types of domain knowledge that are available to us strongly inform our approach to a smart algorithm design. A smart algorithm is going to have to extract some salient features from input data that are salient and relevant to the result we are trying to compute. And if we have a priori knowledge of our domain, then an engineer can design salient feature extraction because they know what makes features salient to the result. In contrast, a machine learning model has to learn from a posteriori knowledge, namely a data set of examples, to extract salient features from the input data. And when it comes to audio applications, we often have a lot of a priori knowledge at our disposal. For example, we know how the human vocal tract works, so we can uh, do things like extract male-frequency sepstrom coefficients. We know a lot about how human perception of audio works. We know how to create critically filtered, uh, critically sampled filter banks and why those are efficient and so on and so forth. And so if you're using MFCCs or even an FFT or constant Q transform in your algorithm, you're already leveraging a priori knowledge. So a priori, so domain knowledge informs what we can do with machine learning or with traditional DSP. And application constraints and priorities are going to inform what's actually practical for us to do. Uh, those constraints and priorities might include things like execution speed, memory use, and power consumption of the deployment platform for our algorithms, but also things like effort, schedule, and skill sets of our team for algorithm development and for algorithm deployment. So in the next few slides, I'll uh, briefly go through some side-by-side -side comparisons of machine learning and more traditional human-engineered DSP algorithms. Uh, this is fairly basic stuff. I'm sure many of you know all of this. I'm just going to uh, make some broad gen generalizations and provide a bit of context to see how these considerations play out. So I'm going to start by talking about data sets. Uh, I'm sure no one here is going to be surprised that for machine learning we need, we need much larger data sets than for human engineered DSP solutions. And again, making a very broad generalization, for machine learning we need hundreds to millions of examples. And for a human engineered DSP solution, we might need dozens to hundreds of examples. 
Also for machine learning, we really need to annotate and very carefully curate our data set so that our models learn what we want them to learn and not some unintended artifact of our training data. For traditional DSP, we also need to annotate and curate our data set, but really that's only for quantitatively measuring the efficacy of our algorithm. So we can generally be much more lax and spend much less effort. Um, working in uh, both audio and machine vision domains, I've worked on projects where machine learning required multi-person year efforts to design create and curate a data set. And I've also worked on projects where uh, a pre-existing data set was readily available or data could be synthesized, and so there was very little effort involved at all. Regarding compute and memory requirements, uh, machine learning models typically require more compute resources. So machine learning models are universal approximators. They need to be able to learn any function from the input examples of the training set, and therefore they need the capacity to represent any function. In contrast, a human-engineered DSP solution implements one specific bespoke uh, function and therefore, it bakes a priori knowledge in simplifying assumptions into the very structure of the code we write to implement that function. So intuitively, you can imagine that any portion that we can implement with DSP can theoretically be more efficient than implementing the same portion of our solution with machine learning. Deploying machine learning models is very different from deploying a human-engineered algorithm. With machine learning, we're going to use a framework like TensorFlow Lite or an API like Core ML. And if we're deploying cross-platform, then we might have to deal with multiple APIs or we may need to integrate our machine learning, plat uh, machine learning framework multiple times for different uh, deployment platforms. And so the effort to deploy can be quite large. We also may need to consider the storage for our um, machine learning model and whether it's small enough to bundle into an application or whether it needs to be downloaded or run in the cloud and so on. For a human-engineered DSP algorithm, we're going to generally deploy a bespoke code module um, and depending on the complexity of the algorithm and how it was developed, that could require months of porting and optimization, although more often recently I've been finding that I can uh, leverage some existing optimized function libraries and uh, often just recompile my algorithm into an application and it just works. So now I want to... Um, show you how I think through an algorithm design problem. I want to teach you the one neat trick that I think really captures how we resolve ambiguities, and therefore it's the one technique that makes smart algorithms smart. So I like to summarize this technique as score many candidate results. What we want in order to resolve ambiguities is for our algorithm to capture every reasonable result that we might need to return. Then we want to quantitatively score how well each of these candidates solves the problem we're trying to solve. And once we have those scores, we can either re return the best scoring candidates, multiple good enough candidates, some sort of weighted average or some other aggregation based on the needs of our application. We're going to propose and score results by extracting many salient features from the input data. So let's look at a simple example of how this might work. Imagine a polyphonic note detector. So this uh, algorithm, let's see if I can get my pointer here. It's going to analyze a short time window of audio at the bottom of the diagram. Um, and it's going to attempt to determine what musical notes are present in this audio. So we can imagine that uh, doing a very brute force proposal, 
uh, of candidates, we have every semitone within some range of octaves. We're going to extract salient features using an FFT, and we're just going to pick out the peaks uh, from, the, from the FFT magnitude. So now we have our uh, candidate results. We have our features. We're going to score each candidate note by iterating over all of the, the spectral peaks and aggregating a confidence measure for the presence of the note in the signal. I'd like to point out that machine learning models are also going to score many candidate results. A machine learning based note detector um, could have the very same set of candidate notes. It will just learn to score those candidates by uh, training from a, ban a bunch of examples. Next, I want to get into detail about how we score the candidate results. We're going to score by feature relevance, feature intensity, and feature agreement. By feature relevance, I mean how meaningful or salient is the feature to the specific candidate. By, uh, so for example, we're going to look at a spectral peak and we're going to see if it's close to an integer mul multiple of the fundamental frequency of a note. Uh, and if it is, then it's probably a component of that note, and it increases our confidence in that note a little bit. By feature inten in intensity, we mean how strongly do we measure the feature in the signal. So for example, we might look at peak magnitude, maybe peak magnitude relative to some estimate of noise floor, maybe a perceptually weighted version of that magnitude. By feature agreement, we, um, I mean the combined effect of many features. So for example, if many spectral peaks are near perfect integer harmonics of some fundamental, then that fundamental is very likely to be a musical note that's present in the signal. We can imagine many types of scoring functions that score by relevance, intensity, and agreement. For example, if we think about these things in terms of probability, we end up with Bayesian inference. Uh, but I want to highlight a particular type of scoring function that I find to be extremely useful, and it's essentially a dot product of the relevance and intensity. So for each candidate, we're going to compute a score by computing a sum over all the features of the relevance of a feature given the candidate times the intensity of the feature. It's often useful to threshold the result of the dot product to throw away weak candidates, and it's also often useful to clip the result of the dot product in order to avoid a particularly strong candidate from overwhelming a result. So now that we've gone through this function for scoring, I want to point out that, again, it's very similar to what neural networks do. A neural network computes a dot product um, of model weights and inputs. Uh, each neuron, in fact, in a neural network computes a dot product of model weights and inputs. And that dot product goes through a nonlinear activation function, which essentially thresholds and clips the result for us. So this is not an accident. This is how ambiguities get resolved. For more complex problems, we want to build hierarchy. By building hierarchy, I mean that we want to think of feature extraction as its own smart algorithm. So let's look at a quick example. Let's imagine a chord classifier. So again, we're going to have uh, a short time window of audio here at the bottom. And we're going to analyze that, and we're going to attempt to figure out what musical chord is present in that audio. So at the very top, in the green boxes, if I can get my pointer back. Here we go. At the very top, in the green boxes, we have chord proposals. Uh, and we know a priori 
that musical notes are salient features of chords, and we know how that works for music theory. So if only we had a polyphonic note detector, then, then we could propose a bunch of chords and we could score each candidate chord from note uh, features by note relevance, note intensity, and note agreement. And so you can see that we've built our chord classifier on top of our polyphonic note detector algorithm. Neural networks um, can, uh, so for more complex problems, we need even more layers. And this is where neural networks really shine. Neural networks learn many layers simultaneously. It's very difficult for a human engineer or a team of human engineers to design many layers at once and converge on a good solution. So I believe that neural networks are so powerful and solve previously unsolvable problems specifically because they learn many layers at once. So, um, Wrapping all of this up, how do we approach a smart algorithm design? We think about our design in terms of a hierarchy of layers that each scores candidate results. We use traditional DSP to leverage a priori domain knowledge, and this allows us to improve efficiency, or if our deployment platform has limited resources and we're pretty sure that we're gonna max out those resources, then leveraging a priori knowledge and using traditional DSP is going to allow us to achieve better quality um, for that uh, deployment platform and those resource constraints. <coughs> and then finally, we're gonna use neural networks to manage deep hierarchy. Any long sequence of layers that we can imagine in our uh, solution is going to be much easier to create if we can just learn all of those layers at once so we can encapsulate them with a neural network and uh, solve, uh, solve our problem this way. And that's it. That is my uh, uh, grand unified theory of smart algorithms. <laughs> So I see we have one minute. Do we have any questions? And by the way, uh, I'll be around all day, so feel free to ask me questions. I'm sure that there are many. Uh, yes, Julius. Wait, wait, wait. Very interesting. Have you, um, have you thought about like combining them? In other words, you can have your deep neural net and then put in known good signal processing structure uh, such as you describe, but leave it all differentiable and have, you know, some fully connected layers on either side and, and just let it all optimize from there. In other words, maybe you could think of uh, traditional uh, signal processing engineering as just giving uh, the neural net a jump start on some decent modeling structure that it may be able to take from there. Um, yes, absolutely. We can leverage a priori knowledge by imagining that the model that we need to end up with is going to need some sort of particular structure. Um, and therefore, we build that structure into somewhere in our, our neural network model and then let it be learned from there. <laughs>